You know, we got a lot of great things going on today and I am very excited to be carrying on in this essential series. How many of y'all are enjoying this series? We are getting the must haves of our Christian faith. And today I am very excited to talk about the topic of that we are commissioned We are commissioned, there we go. We are commissioned, called and commissioned. Actually, let's go back to the other side real quick. We're gonna have all of our notes on the YouVersion app. We've partnered with YouVersion for this series. And so if you take out your phone and hover your camera right over that QR code, we would love for you to be able to follow along. We are going to have some incredible unpacking of scripture today. And a lot of times when we sit in a service like this, we're like, oh, it's coming so quick. Well, you get to come home, go home, Open up your phone and you will have those notes for you to continue the journey of learning what the essentials are. So today is called and commissioned. We hear those terms a lot throughout scriptures that Jesus called the disciples. He called lots of people unto him. He tells us that you're not just called, you're chosen, right? I chose you, you didn't choose me. That's what Jesus said. And commissioned is that we have a responsibility We have a role to play, but the question is, is that for them or is that for me? Is is Jesus talking about someone else or is he talking about me? Am I included? Well, let's go to Matthew chapter 28. It says this, Jesus came and told his disciples. Now this was after Jesus had rose from the grave. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore go. Jesus said, because I have all authority on heaven in heaven and on earth, I need you to go and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, that I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus is saying, I've got a job for you to do. There's a responsibility. There's a buy-in that I need you as my followers to lean in and be a part of. You see, the scripture that I just read is actually called the Great Commission. It's that you and I have been given permission by Jesus. You and I have been given permission and authority by Jesus to carry out the orders of Christ to go and make disciples. Why did God do it this way? Well, we find it in John chapter 3, verse 16. It says, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son that so ever who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Now, a lot of times in our busyness, a lot of times in our day-to-day or maybe the frustrations come on with this world, the frustrations with the culture, sometimes you may just want to go in a hole and hide. But we tend to forget, we could be tempted to forget that God loves the world and has a plan for it. Even in our busyness, even in our frustration, even in all my to-dos and my aspirations, God loves the world and he has a plan for it. It says this in 2 Peter chapter, verse, or chapter 2, 3, verse 9, the Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. So I want to encourage you, if you find yourself frustrated with the world, You find yourself frustrated with culture and the things that are happening all around us. And you're asking yourself, Jesus, why ain't you back yet? Like this would be a perfect time for you to come and shut this business down and let's go start anew, amen? Amen. But why does he say not yet? Because his heart is that he doesn't want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. And guess what? God's plan to reach the world includes you. It includes you. He loves the world, he included you. He doesn't want anyone to perish. He included you. He included you in this great commission of permission and authority. See, you are called to be a disciple of Jesus. Think about disciple. It's a student. It's an apprentice. Jesus invited people to come and not only hear his ways, but learn his ways. And not only learn his ways, but do these things alongside him and then eventually go and do them on their own by the power of the Holy Spirit. So you are a disciple. Jesus called you unto himself to come and learn and to be like him. Come on, can we just say that that is an awesome privilege? It is an awesome privilege to be called and chosen by God, to be invited into his family, to be privileged to sit at his feet and learn his ways. But hear me, friends, it doesn't stop there. You're commissioned to go and make disciples. You've been granted permission and authority to therefore go and to teach and to share 
with others who Christ is. Now, the problem is that we've got some distorted discipleship in our century. We've got in the westernized church especially, now what do I mean by the westernized church? I mean anything west, uh, west side of the earth, westernized culture. We have a distorted view of discipleship, and this is what we believe. We believe that the pastor, well, that's their job, yeah. right? Th- that's their job, that's their role, their commission, they're paid. They need to, to do this thing. They need to disciple the lost and the broken world, and us as a congregation, we will cheer them on, and we will watch them as the pastor goes and disciples this lost, broken, and fallen world. But is that what scripture really tells us? No, the scripture tells us that you are my disciple. You are called and chosen. I didn't, you didn't choose me, I chose you. But I chose you to go and to be fruitful, amen? I chose you to go and make disciples. So yes, is it part of the pastor's responsibility to disciple, to go after the lost, to go after those who are broken and need healing? Absolutely, but one of his main responsibilities, her main responsibility is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. It's that we receive teachings, We not only do it in an atmosphere like this, but we get into smaller groups. We have to understand that yes, Jesus taught in large gatherings, but Jesus also gathered smaller groups. Groups of 12, groups of three, one-on-one. He had one-on-one discipleship, small group discipleship. So what happens is as I am a student and as I'm learning and I'm gleaning and I'm soaking all this in, because this is amazing. This is life-changing the truths of Jesus. But there has to be this, this, this thing that happens in my life. And whoop, right next, there we go. Where I receive the gospel. I repent. I, I realize the truth in Jesus and I cannot live this way anymore. I, I can't think this way. I can't talk. I mean, there is just, God has something so much better for me. And then I begin to believe, I believe that Jesus is who he says he is. That everything in scripture is God breathed. I believe that I'm baptized. Come on, at this church, we're not just baptized in water, we're baptized in the Holy Spirit. We have an overflowing of the Spirit of God. And then I'm being discipled. But what comes next? I'm being discipled. I'm learning. I'm growing. What comes next? I'm holding on to this Bible because this was the first Bible that was given to me when I seriously committed my life to Christ. I remember my, my friend's dad went and got a Bible off of his shelf. And he asked me, what is your favorite scripture? And at that time, it was Philippians chapter one, verse six, that God who began a good work in me was gonna continue that work, carry it on to completion to the day of Christ Jesus. And so he put my name, it was Lindsay Mose back then, my maiden name, and Philippians chapter one, verse six. And hear me, I loved being a student. I loved learning. I remember this dad and my friend, they would take us door to door and they would show us how to literally knock and share Jesus with the person who answered the door. I remember my friend said the best five place to find people to pray for is at Walmart. And so we would go to Walmart and I'm totally, we were totally profiling people to pray. I'm so sorry. But I was looking at people like, they look like they could use some prayer, right? So you're like just kind of following people down the bathroom aisle and whatnot and <laughs> praying for people at Walmart. But it was a soaking in, it was a discipleship opportunity where he was showing me how to love and live like Jesus did. But there this came this time as I was reading scriptures. I'm in church. I'm in this small group. I'm learning and learning and learning. And something is happening in me. I'm reading of spiritual gifts and that God not only placed gifts in me when I was in my mother's womb, but there are gifts that I'm supposed to earnestly seek after. I'm reading that there could be gifts of hospitality, mercy, healing, prophecy, speaking in tongues. All of these things are coming out. And I'm like, what's that life about? There, there's something else. And you know what we call this? We call it a life on mission. It's on mission that I'm seeing throughout scriptures what Christ did, the lengths that he went to to step out and to reach those who were lost, to heal the brokenhearted, to heal the sick, to transform lives, to reconcile relationships. And I wanted to be a part of it. I was on fire, y'all. I was so excited. Do you know that our church, Avenue, we have a mission too. The mission of Avenue Church is to make a way for people to know God and experience new life. 
Friends, this new life is the abundant life that Jesus talks about. When he says that the enemy has come only to steal, to kill and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it to the full, overflowing, that is that new life. That spirit filled, not on my own strength. God is doing something new. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus and I am living out this transformation. It's a life on mission. And that's exciting. But in our essential series, I have to address something when it comes to being commissioned and called. Because there are so many stories represented in this room. There's so many backgrounds and experiences on how we came to know Christ or maybe how we came to to be a part of a church. The reality is, is that for most of us, Avenue was not our first church. So we all enter this room and yes, I'm going to be commissioned. I'm going to be called. But we've got to address a question in the room. And that is this. When it comes to being called and commissioned, are both men and women equally invited to live a life fully on mission for Christ? It's a legitimate question. Next question is, are women restricted in kingdom ministry because of their gender? Now, what we're going to do over the next few moments because this is important. We use the word doctrine to describe what is my core belief? What is a belief that I have and my biblical upbringing? We have to be able to answer the question because it's essential to know what you believe and why you believe it. For some of us in this room, we believe things because it was taught to us. We took it at face value and we ran with it. For others, we, we, we walked into here and maybe this is your first church and, and you saw that, well, Jeremy and Lindsay both preached. So yes, I believe in this, but what, where does it come from? And so what I want to do is we're going to call what's, it's called exegesis, which means that we're going to go verse by verse in some areas in the Bible to look at why are we talking about this topic today? Because hear me, friends, it's not just something that we're bringing up in 2023 because we're a progressive people. It's not that. It's that, God, you wrote your word and your word is timeless. And I, as a student of the word and given the the Holy Spirit as a gift of wisdom, the word tells us that when you need wisdom, he gives it generously. You just need to ask. And so I'm gonna ask is that, could we act like we're sitting down and having a cup of coffee? Could we open up our Bibles together? And can we have a conversation that matters? Because it matters because hear me, if we believe a discipleship method, If we believe that we are called and commissioned to go therefore and make disciples, right? That all of us are part of it. All of us are a disciple and we're all going to the lost and broken world. If we do not believe that women are equally invested and invited, then what we're saying is that amount of people are going to go out into the world and are going to make a difference. And I want to address this. So let's go to a scripture that many have gotten the belief and the understanding, the doctrine that women are limited in ministry and leadership. It's found in 1 Timothy chapter two. It says this, women should learn quietly and submissively. I do not let women teach men or have authority over them. Let them listen quietly. For God made Adam first and afterward he made Eve. And it was not Adam who was deceived by Satan. The woman was deceived and sin was the result. But women will be saved through childbearing, assuming they continue to live in faith, love, holiness, and modesty. Now it's very important when we are diving into scripture and we are reading scripture, it's very important as students of the word that we have to understand that the Bible was written for communities of people living in the ancient world to pass down the story of God. We learned that in our our essential faith series, didn't we? When we talked about faith, we said, what is the issue with our faith not being handed down? We're not telling enough stories. And the Bible is a collaboration. It's a gathering of these truthful stories that were impacting communities of people living in the ancient world to pass down the story of God, Jesus, and the church. These communities were all facing their own specific issues and conflicts. As we approach reading and especially interpreting the Bible, we must consider the context. What is the context? It means that there are scriptures that happened before 1 Timothy chapter 2, and there are scriptures that happen after 1 Timothy chapter 2. The beautiful thing about context and reading something in the paragraph, have you ever got a text message and you only read one line of it? I made this mistake when it shows up on my screen. I read the first couple lines because that's all that's displayed with me. 
before I hit it to see the real thing. Have you ever read this a couple of things and said, oh, like you think it's like a 911? Like you get a thing like, Levi busted his head open. Well, if I would open my text message, I would see, but he's all good now. The bleeding stopped. He doesn't need stitches. But what if I only saw Levi busted his head open and it's bleeding, right? So here's what it does. Context brings clarity. We have to understand that in order to have clarity, and God is not the author of confusion, we have to look at the big picture. See, what happens with the letter that Paul is writing, we intercepted here in 2023, anyone reading this after it was written, we intercepted a direct message written to somebody else. And we are trying to interpret it based on our own personal lives. So here's the struggle when it comes to interpreting the Bible that all Bible students, you're not the only one, I'm not the only one, all Bible students will struggle with is that we are opening a context, a letter that was written over 2,000 years ago to a specific situation in crisis. But what we're trying to do is, God, because you never change, you're the, you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. Your word is timeless. How does this read and apply to my life right now? See, it says women should learn quietly and submissively. I do not let women teach men or have authority over them. Let them listen quietly. If I were to pull this right now and take it exactly as what it says, not looking at the context, I would need to go sit down because I would believe that I'm in the wrong, that I have no authority to teach because the Apostle Paul said so. But let's look at the context. We have to understand that Paul was issuing a situational decree, not a universal decree. You have to think about it. When we were in a 911 status, when we were walking through a pandemic in 2020, we experienced a lockdown. That was a specific lockdown for a specific amount of time. Now, will that happen with every pandemic that we go through as a nation? Or has it always happened with every pandemic that we've gone through as a nation? No, it was for a specific moment and a specific time. We have to understand what was the situational issue in Ephesus? Because when we read the Bible, and here's why I love that you should get a good study Bible. Because if you get a good study Bible, you can open up to 1 Timothy. And it will tell you on the very first page who is the author of the letter. It'll tell you when that letter was written. It'll tell you what is the author addressing. Who is he writing to? What are the main points? Because if not, in our own abilities, we have a difficult time understanding the context. Are you following me? Okay. So what's the situation in Ephesus? If we were to read the entire letter that the Apostle Paul wrote, we would see that false teachings were tearing apart the local church. Yeah. They were. False teachers were coming in and they were sharing false doctrine and that doctrine was getting repeated. Hear me, not primarily by men, but primarily by women. We're guilty. Women were targeted by false teachers and where women were doing is they were taking that false doctrine and they were going house to house and sharing the false doctrine with believers and non-believers. And so now you've got a very messy situation in Ephesus and because Paul is in prison and he's writing to Timothy who is in charge. Don't you love being in charge? We all wanna be in charge until there's a crisis, amen? So now there's a crisis in Timothy, you have to fix this situation. Because the church that you are leading, the church I have charged you with, is falling apart because of false teachers. And they are pulling people away. And the people in our church, especially the women, they are going house to house sharing this information. See, what we have to understand is that Timothy was leading the church through a crisis and Paul instructed him with specific steps for this specific crisis. Paul's solution to the spreading of false teaching was to immediately silence the women. Silence them. They're not allowed to talk. They've got questions, have masked their spouse. They got questions, they ask somebody outside of church. They don't get to talk anymore. See, friends, when we don't read things in context, we can easily pull something out and say, whoo, that's not allowed. If we were to do that with every scripture, can you imagine how confused, friends, we would be? Yeah. See, I want to share this because you're like, okay, well, Lindsay, well, that's just one scripture. Let me, let me again, let's go context. Paul wrote the book 2 Timothy two years later. So he writes this letter, the 1 Timothy, to him because there's false teachings, false doctrines spreading in the church of Ephesus, and we have to stop it. Two years later, Paul writes a second letter to Timothy. He says, Timothy, I thank God for you. The God I serve with a clear conscience, just as my ancestors did. Night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. 
I long to see you again, for I remember your tears as we parted, and I will be filled with joy when we are together again. I remember your genuine faith, for you share the faith that first filled who? Your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I know that that same faith continues strong in you. See, often if we read 1 Timothy and we read his first letter, we think that, ooh, there's not a lot of praise going on for women. There's not honor going for women. We're actually going to shrink women back and put them aside. No, he is honoring and he is giving due, he's giving due diligence and due honor where it's due to Lois and to Eunice that you know what you impacted? Timothy's faith. That faith that is so strong in Timothy, that faith that he is leading and loving people with, that first came from his grandmother and his mother. This is why I remind you to fan into flame the spiritual gift that God gave you when I laid my hands on you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. In this same letter, in his closing in 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul tells Timothy, I need you to give my greetings to who? Priscilla and Aquila, and those living in the household of, we'll call them O, and all these different names. But then it goes on to say, and so do Putin's, Linus, Claudia, and all the brothers and sisters. So why has the tone changed? Why is he now praising and saying, don't forget to say hello to Priscilla and Aquila? Why is he now putting women up front when before in just the previous letter, we're asking them to shrink back? I want to talk about real quick Priscilla and Aquila. I want you to see, because this is not two women, this is a husband and a wife. We first meet them in Acts. It says, then Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he became acquainted with a Jew named Aquila. He was born in Pontus who had recently arrived from Italy with his wife, Priscilla. They had left Italy when Claudius Caesar deported all the Jews from Rome. Paul lived and worked with them for they were tent makers just as he was. It goes on to say, meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, and we've heard Apollos, Apollos was a a big evangelist, a big teacher in the early church. He's an eloquent speaker who knew the scriptures well. He arrived in Ephesus from Alexandria in Egypt. He had been taught the way of the Lord and he taught others about Jesus with an enthusiastic spirit. This guy was excited to listen to. People love to gather around Apollos and listen to his teachings about Christ. But here's the thing. Yes, he taught it with accuracy. However, he knew only about John's baptism. He knew about baptism in water. He had not yet been introduced to the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit that Christ gave us as a gift to walk in equipping and empowering to what? Do the work of the ministry. We're called and we're commissioned and then we are strengthened by the Holy Spirit to go and do the work. And so now we have this really charismatic speaker, but he doesn't know about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So who gets sent to talk to him? Priscilla and Aquila. Now, let me tell you why it's important that Priscilla's name is mentioned first. Anytime in Greek writing, when they are going to mention a first person, it's not that that person is dominant, it's that that person is more of the leader. That person is more the one that needs to receive the recognition because they are the more of the one in charge. That is across the board, the method for ancient Greek writing. Luke was a doctor. Luke wrote the book of Acts. If anybody was going to cross his T's and dot his I's, it is Luke. So according to the way that ancient Greek was written, Luke was giving honor where where honor was due. So when we say that somebody had to take this charismatic teacher aside and say, let me tell you about the Holy Ghost. Priscilla, then Aquila. And you can't say that, oh, well, it's just out of out of respect because she's a woman. Well, no, when we were introduced to her just a couple chapters ago, it was Aquila and his wife, Priscilla. But once people start working and moving in their giftings, hear me, we are equally commissioned, equally called, but giftings are different. When we walk in those things, her gifting was more prevalent in the teaching and the developing of disciples. So they heard him preaching boldly in the synagogue and they took him aside and they explained the way of God even more accurately. Do you know what? That's my heart today. That we have an accurate understanding of the word, but can we have an even more accurate understanding of the word? Because where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, right? There is freedom in truth. So we have to understand that Priscilla and Aquila, they hosted the church in Corinth. They sailed with Paul. They remained in Ephesus to spread the gospel. Before there was a Timothy, there was a Priscilla and Aquila planting churches in Ephesus. 
They gathered new converts in their home. They raised up new disciples. They taught Apollos. We cannot forget about the voices throughout the scriptures that make a big impact. Come on, even in 2023. So that may lay the work out for Paul in addressing this specific issue of false doctrines and asking women to remain silent. But there are also two other scriptures in the Bible that talk about women needing to be covered and women needing to be humble and meek in silence again. But again, are we looking at specific issues in specific churches? Because if we want to look at these specific issues, we have to see, well, what is Paul's tone throughout the other letters that he wrote? We have to understand that the Apostle Paul wrote 13 letters to the churches. Do you know that First and Second Timothy were the very last letters that he wrote? We have a span of almost 20 years of letters. So when we stumble upon scripture that makes us go, huh, we have 20 years of watching how Paul dealt with women in the ministry to look at. In fact, in Romans chapter 16, I want to show you this. If you read the chapter 16 of Romans, you'll see that Paul greets 27 people by name. 10 of those people are described with serious ministry contributions. Paul is writing to say, who has done what? Seven of those 10 people are women. In fact, if you go to Romans chapter 16, verse one and two, he's telling the Roman church, I commend to you, meaning I, Paul, with all my authority as an apostle, I am sending to you your sister, our sister, Phoebe, who is a what? A deacon. I want you to think about this for a second. Because in 1 Timothy chapter 2, we learn that women are supposed to be silent. And then in chapter 3, we learn what are the responsibilities and roles and expectations of a deacon. But in Romans, what he wrote way before that, Sister Phoebe was a deacon in the church in Centria. Welcome her in the Lord is the one who is worthy of honor among God's people. He is saying she is worthy of honor among God's people. Help her in whatever she needs, for she has been helpful to many and especially to me. That is his stamp of approval. Now hear me, Jesus does not have favorites. There's no favoritism in Christ Jesus and we cannot practice favoritism. So Paul cannot say, oh, it's good for Phoebe, but it's not good for all the other ladies. It's not okay. It's not okay. Let's go here. If we're not satisfied with looking at the apostle Paul because he's just a man, right? He's just a human being. Can we look at Jesus's interactions with women? We have four books of the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that record the witnesses, record the the walking, the living, the breathing things that Jesus did. And so let's look at Jesus's interactions with women. When Jesus was first born, he was brought to the temple to be presented to the Lord. Do you know that Anna is distinguished there as the first person to be called a prophet in the New Testament? The word of the Lord had been silent for years and years and years. And the first one to be distinguished in the class of a prophet is a woman in Luke chapter two. Let's go on. The first time Jesus revealed himself as Messiah, the very first time he said, I am the Messiah. It was to the woman at the well in a private conversation. See, Jewish men did not talk to women. That was a human tradition. That was a religious rule brought up by human people, not by the Lord. And these men would not talk to women, but Jesus asked the disciples, go into town and get some food. I have an appointment. And he went and met not just any woman, but a Samaritan woman. If anyone would have had prejudice, it would have been a Jew because a Samaritan is a half-breed. Excuse my words, but that's how it's described, a half-breed. They're from Samaria. They're not, they're not fully Jewish. They're not pure. They're half-breeds. And yet here's Jesus standing with a woman who's actually had multiple partners. And he tells her, if you knew who was in front of you, if you knew the living water that was standing in front of you, you would drink of this and you would thirst no more. She's like, what are you talking about? That's only the Messiah, right? She says, what are you talking about? That's for the Messiah. He goes, I am the Messiah. Friends, he said it to a woman. He said it to a woman. And he trusted that woman because she went and told everybody, there's a man who knows something about me. So why are we going to get mad and make a universal decree that because women get excited and women like to talk, now we got to silence them. Sheesh. 
this lady was sleeping with somebody who wasn't her husband and she was allowed to talk by Jesus, okay? Okay. The Gospels name 23 people in Jesus' inner circles. You've got the 12 disciples, you've got a couple other people. Do you know that there are seven named women? That's almost one third of his inner circle. They were women. Mary, the mother of Jesus, Mary Magdalene, the other Mary. Isn't that sad? It's like the other Lindsay. <laughs> She's literally known, the other Mary. That says Marty, that's supposed to say Mary of Bethany. I'm sorry, I did my own slides. <laughs> Mary of Bethany, not Marty. Joanna, Susanna, and Salome. Do you know that women traveled and did ministry with Jesus? See, a lot of times, friends, we, we, we pick our scriptures that we love or we pick chapters of the Bible that we really enjoy reading. But if we were to read in context, look at this. Soon afterward, Jesus began a tour of the nearby towns and villages, preaching and announcing the good news about the kingdom of God. He took his 12 disciples with him along with some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Among them were Mary Magdalene from whom he had cast out seven demons, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's business manager, Susanna, and many others who were contributing from their own resources to support Jesus and his disciples. The women traveled with Jesus. They made a way to support financially the ministry of Jesus. Can I tell you this? This one hits hard. Women were the last at the cross and they were the first at the tomb. Women were the last at the cross and the first at the tomb. Our resurrected Savior first appeared to a woman, not to a man. Our resurrected Savior first appeared to a woman, Mary Magdalene, and he trusted her, a woman, to go and tell the other disciples that your God is not dead, he is risen. Let me tell you why this is so important. Because culturally back then, she couldn't even stand in a witness, as a witness in a court of law. She couldn't. She, her, her word would have been taken of nothing in front of a Pharisee, a Sadducee, a local judge, they didn't care about her, but what did Jesus do? Jesus cared. So if we think for one moment that God has dis like made distinctives that are limiting and not praising of our sexes, oh, friends, we just have to look at his relationship with them. We have to look at that. And if it's not enough for you or for me on, on how Jesus interacted with women, well, let's look at creation. How does God see women? Let's look at creation. The Lord said, it is not good for a man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. See, in our 2023 eyes, and not just our eyes, friends, in centuries, in hundreds and thousands of years, we think of helper as secondary and subservient. That Eve is the secondary and Adam is the primary. But we need to understand, what is that word helper? Because what we've done is we've taken something that was either originally written in Hebrew, the Old Testament, or written in Greek, the New Testament, and we have done our best to translate it in English terms. But in our translation, friends, we have lost the passion. We have lost the honesty and the authenticity of Scripture. That word helper suitable is ezer konegdo. In Hebrew, it means helper, aid, strength, rescue, to save. So to ezer someone, to be a helper, to ezer someone is to strengthen someone in a way that they cannot strengthen themselves. Friends, that doesn't sound very subservient to me. The word ezer occurs 21 times in the Old Testament. In two cases, it refers to the first woman, Eve. Three times, it refers to powerful nations that Israel called on for what? For help. Israel needed to call on three strong nations. Come be my Ezer. And the remaining 16 cases refer to God as their Ezer, as their strength. So why would God use a term that we equate to being subservient or less than to describe himself? Eve was Ezer to Adam a suitable helper, different and distinct, but there to strengthen in areas that he could not strengthen himself. Can I tell you, friends, that whether you are male or female, we are called to co-labor in this commission and this calling of God. See, the relationship between the first man and the woman is defined by mutual support, mutual appreciation, the sharing of one's strengths to complement the other and of recognition of the same and different. Sometimes we think, well, then we're ignoring everything different. We're not ignoring gender differences. We're celebrating them. 
We're celebrating, but we're recognizing that the Holy Spirit, that Jesus, Jesus did not call you because of your gender. He called you because you needed salvation. He called you because he has a plan and a purpose for your life. And the Holy Spirit, who he says, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to give you a helper, an advocate, a comforter. That Holy Spirit who commissions us in our calling, who equips us to walk therefore and make disciples, not on my own strength, come on, but in the strength of the Almighty God. The same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you and I. And that is not based on your reproductive system. What I can tell you where God draws the line, it's not between male and family, it's between sin and world. That is the line. It's between holiness and worldliness. So the question goes again, why do you believe what you believe? This August, I celebrated 19 years of full-time ministry. 19 years. But I can tell you the things that I've endured. And I think of the women that went before me and I'm thankful for for trailblazers. But I gotta tell you my heart, this is not a feminist movement. This isn't, it has nothing to do with, with that. I remember when I entered into ministry, do you know what my first pastor told me in my school of ministry? You gotta be better than the boys. Do you know what that did to me? It stripped me of who Lindsay was. That Lindsay, just by herself, pleasing to God. That God called Lindsay in Susan's womb. God placed Lindsay with gifts and strengths and purpose, knowing that one day he was gonna call her to more. And I don't need to be like anybody else. I don't need to be better than anybody else or it's not a competition. But what somebody did is they were trying They are trying to give permission for me to be who I am, which is called and commissioned by God. I'm not like you, you're not like me, but that's great. That all the body is many parts. But my heart for you to hear today is found in Galatians chapter three. It says, for you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. Guys, it feels good to put on Jesus. Feels good to to take off that old life and put on Christ. And there's no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. We love to hear that the promise belongs to us, but do you know what Abraham got before the promise? He got a command. He said, go. God told Abraham to go. Go where you haven't been before. Go and trust me. Go and make new relationships. Go and spread out, multiply. God said the same thing to you and I, that I am commissioned. I'm called and commissioned because I'm a child of God through faith in Christ Jesus. So me and you, called and commissioned, but we all have the choice to whether we go. I don't want to be a spectator church. I don't want to raise and pastor and love. Oh, I love you so much. I do, I, I, I eat, breathe and sleep this church. I love that God has privileged us with you, but we gotta go. All of us gotta go. Not looking this way, looking that way because there's a lost and broken world that needs you. There's siblings in your life that need you. There's sons and daughters that need you to share the gospel of Jesus. There's coworkers that are blinded in their sin and yet God wants to use you to help tear off that veil and show the life and light that's in Jesus. So would you stand with me today? Thank you. (laughs) Thank you for listening to it. Jesus gave us a seat at the table. Friends, it's what we do with that seat. And my heart is if we could all just turn around, face that way, let's all face that way. We're not looking at me, we're looking at the wall. That wall represents a big city. That wall represents our friends, our family, people we haven't met yet. That wall represents the hurting, the broken, the lost, the lonely. And God has called me to go therefore and make disciples, to baptize, to see people healed, 
to see people delivered. The same experience that you've experienced, the love, the acceptance of Jesus. Friends, he wants to use you to share that same thing with the world. And do not grow impatient as God is being patient because his desire is that none would perish. So if you close your eyes real quick, Father, I ask that you would give us the strength. Give us this deep conviction that I am called and commissioned by God. That I didn't ask for this, you asked me to do it. And my heart's desire is to be submitted to you and say yes. I thank you that you've made us all your Ezer, God, your helper. But you in return are our helper. You're our strength, God. We don't do this on our own might. So I just pray, God, that this local body of church can be an igniting of co-laborers in Christ, that regardless of our age, regardless of, God, you called Moses late in his age. God, you gave Abraham a dream late in his age. But you also called those that are young. Paul told Timothy, don't anyone look down on you because you're youth. So regardless of our age, it's not an excuse to be called or commissioned. Our gender is not an excuse whether to be called or commissioned. God, it's our hearts. And I pray that you would position our hearts to go therefore and care, to go therefore and seek, to go therefore, God, and let's plunder hell and populate heaven to see people come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Because if he did it for me, he could do it for them. In your name we pray. Amen, 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 and amen.